What's up, Ego Hackers? This is Chase with CS Joseph.life doing another how to type famous people live stream. Uh, thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, collecting super chats to determine who we're going to be typing tonight. And if we don't get any super chats, then uh, I guess that means, well, I mean, I'm going to be typing people then uh, if that's the case. And uh, let's double check to make sure that we have our uh, whiteboard up there. And yeah, it looks like we do. And awesome. So uh, glad to have uh, technology working for once. I do recognize that I'm an hour late today, but uh, been having some um, health issues and uh, getting treated for that. So had to postpone uh, that slightly to be able to uh, continue uh, tonight. So let's actually take a look as to where we left off for the last... Uh, last live stream in terms of super chats just to make sure I didn't miss anything um, okay all right so let's see and okay so last time I did this was on the looks like the questions and then Great, so last time we did this was October 15th, and uh, got some in there. And the top super chat from last time is Phoebe Waller-Bridge. So unless we see some new super chats, that's who I'm gonna get started with. Hopefully the sound and everything works out ahead of time. So, awesome. Uh, you got the memo. Well, thank you, uh, Jacob. Although, honestly, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce uh, your surname, good sir. But uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, at least we can get that figured out as well. John Allen, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ahava Winter, uh, thank you for your suggestion. And uh, I appreciate you saying that, uh, good sir. Uh, Captain Snooze, what's going on, man? Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, it's pretty awesome uh, to have you here tonight. And PB and J, that's actually really cool, dude. Leash Narrows, awesome to have you here, good sir. And Boris Van Droof, uh, one of uh, one of my favorite uh, commenters on this channel. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Shaktel, got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Gabriela uh, Vargas. Hola, como esta usted? Um, and Starry Nights, I also enjoy every time you're joining us as well. So uh, why not uh, get down to it here? So let's see here. Let's go to YouTube and then uh, see if we can, uh, let's see here. Um, BB, Waller Bridge interview. Get that going here and here. Awesome. Uh, made Meryl Streep laugh. Okay, 73 questions backstage on how actors should create their own work. Okay, yeah, why not? Let's do that. So. Let me know if you guys can hear this just Hi, everyone. Fine, um, this is on, right? Uh, I'm Benjamin Lindsay, senior editor at Backstage. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the screening of the first two episodes of season two of Fleabag. Um, of course, the star of the evening, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, is here. Um, so without further ado, she'll join us now. Based on Fleabag. Um, and you're kind of making the rounds talking to people like me for your 11 Emmy nominations. Wow, is, is she like an introverted censor? She's like dressed for comfort here, so I wonder I wonder uh, what that's going on. Okay, Ozzy Osbourne, that's like a super hard one. We'll get to that as soon as we're done with this, Bordis. Um. Um, yeah. So I, I was just thinking about it and it's, it's fun. Does anyone else think that this interviewer is like a Topher Grace clone? Has anyone got that yet? I mean, that's the vibe I'm getting from this, you know. Funny that something that started as a one-woman show 
um, presumably a one-off thing. You've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. Um, yes, I've been milking it <laughs> yeah. since 2013. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> as much out of it as I can. Yeah. Um, well, what, what, what's been the most surprising part for you just with living with this character for so long in a way that you're not necessarily expected? I mean, every stage of it is a surprise, really. I mean, even when we first took the play to Edinburgh and it was just this tiny little gang of us and... Tiny just little gang. <laughs> I didn't catch that. You have to speak up for Siri. I'm sorry, Siri. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be clearer with my elocution for you. Maybe an American. Maybe that's what Siri likes. Um... <laughs> that was the most surprising thing that's happened to me uh, since this whole process. Um, but I think, yeah, I think every stage of it, because, uh, you know, it was always just one foot in front of the other with this show. And even doing the play in the first place was sort of like, let's see, you know, it's sort of, you know, it was so personal and it was such a risk to, it felt like such a risk just to say the things that I really thought women say privately to each other. Um, Oh, I thought it was a risk that uh, women say this thing to each other privately and whatnot. Okay, I mean, I don't know, like, if that doesn't sound affiliative, what does? So, okay, fair enough, Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe Waller uh, Bridge, um, why not? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, cool. Um, we're going to have strike, uh, put one strike there for... Uh, uh, um, and so. and that resonated and then I mean then getting the pilot and then Amazon coming on board and I mean every single element of it but I think probably the most surprising is the fact that um, that we made a season two I never imagined that in a million years I mean it was a dream to make it uh, the uh, the first series but the second one I was sure um, I sure I was sure you know I wouldn't think of anything uh, to come back because it felt like such a closed story by the end it mm. felt like it was an ending um, and so for it to have happened and come out and to have... It felt like it was ending, and for that to happen, it kind of seems like expert sensing, uh, expert sensing, expert intuition to me, the way that she's talking about the external thing, not her own experience, the experience of the thing in general. That this response was just the most extraordinary feeling in the world. Certainly, certainly. And we kind of start getting a taste of it in this episode. Oh, Toe for Grace clone is back at it again. Episode in the therapy scene. Um, Fiona Shaw, I mean, incredible. Um, but it, at least from my perspective, it seems very natural in the transition from stage to screen to break the fourth wall in that way, just kind of as a narrative device. But in this season, you're navigating it as kind of a real extension of her psyche. And I'm curious what that development was like. Being something fresh from the first season. And it was always part of her psyche for me, not uh, even at the play stage, that the relationship she had with the audience was the most um, important one. The idea that you come in... The relationship she had with the audience, that was the most important one. Uh, going to have to say that's probably a C and I. I could make, you know, when you're saying the important one, a T-E-F-I, or I could make it a T-I-F-E statement, depending on whose perspective of value. So I'm not really sure about how to classify that quite yet. Uh, because the uh, saying, you know, what the value is, but let's uh, keep going. She kind of seems responding to me as well. She's always staying in the, con the context of the question being asked. So I'm going to put one point down for uh, responding for now. And, and there's a character who's presenting as someone who's completely fine and is promising you a good time. And then actually what's revealed over the process is actually the relationship that you have with her is the most complex because she's been lying to you. She's been covering things up. She's got a secret. And, um, and so actually hopefully you discover by the end of the first season that she's um that it's been a persona hopefully that you discover by the first season again it's more extroverted sensing se and i for sure more expert sensing that she's been peddling um and so for the second season when that pers persona collapses at the end of the first season and sh and she's got nothing to hide anymore because the audience knows her secret the idea of coming back and having the same kind of like eyebrowy uh, hello, I'm uh, persona felt really disingenuous, um, and so that that persona felt very disingenuous. Oh, that's kind of a TIFE statement, talking about the feeling that other people are going to have to receive. For me, as an actor to begin with, I was like, I can't imagine looking at the camera with the same level of like sass and front that um, that she'd had before because the audience, she's exposed her secret to the audience. 
And uh, so it had to be a new relationship. And so going into it, I, and I, I thought of it very much as an actor from the first place. I was thinking there's something kind of frightening about the audience now because they know they know exactly who she is. So she's got to have a different kind of front, which is at the beginning of the first episode, which is I'm, I'm fine. I seem to be fine. I feel like I'm fine, except I'm empty and hollow inside and I'm still dying. <laughs> Ooh, empty and hollow inside, and I'm still dying because I'm super mega emo. Okay, that's T-I-F-E as well. It's kind of interesting, though, because she's really abstracting this whole situation with her other character. I'm putting down a point for, for abstract because she's abstracting all these possibilities, including, like, her own perspective, although it's an external perspective around the camera, et cetera, which is expert at sensing. We might have an INFJ on our hands here, actually. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, okay, uh, let's keep going. I am going to see if there might be another uh, interview to look at. So, so was that like, you can't have my number or what are we? I did know that I was gonna start with the massive asshole joke. I just knew, I was gonna say in my asshole, I just knew. <laughs> That was the joke was, at the was, start. I felt it by that. Was the massive um, asshole joke in the in the play? Yeah, but it's like two thirds of the way through the play, and it's just it's just quite a throwaway joke about a guy that well, in the same way that it is uh, in the in the in the pilot. But um, it was just another guy she's had sex with, and it's just a kind of joke that you build up to. But um, but there was just something about the innocence and the natural vulnerability of her um, before that moment more experted sensing and talking about the natural innocence. So she's definitely STP NFJ Quadra, definitely a Templar. Yes, spoil alert, the next Quadra video, the STP NFJ Quadra is known as the Templars. We'll be talking more about the Templars in an upcoming episode for season 17. Uh, it's kind of like how people are like, ow, oh, how dare you call the SFJ NTP Quadra Crusaders, you know? Uh, like, yeah, well, that's because STP NFJ Quadra is the Templar, so I'll explain why when we actually look at the uh, specific terminology, etc. So, um, and yes, the Socionics lettering system is technically superior to the MBTI system, but the Socionics lettering system has bad SEO, and that's why I don't use it. So, let's be straight. Saying, like, you know, like, you can relate to this because we've all fancied someone, and we've all wanted someone to turn up in the middle of the night and... She's constantly talking about the process of what's happening, so definitely movement. She's very movement, and she's also direct, so direct responding movement. She's STP, NFJ, Quadra. She can only be ISTP or INFJ at this point, uh, and uh, based on that uh, affiliative abstract, she'd already be an INFJ, but let's keep going. Uh, and, you know, sweep off, sweep off, off our feet and everything. And the kind of uh, innocence and vulnerability of that played straight down the barrel, um, uh, I thought was just a really relatable way to start it. And then <laughs> it just is a slightly surprising twist at the end. And as long as she's genuinely worried that she has a massive asshole as well, that was the kind of trick. Um, um, and then I suppose, yeah, I don't know, it's really weird. That scene was, was very, very clear to me that, that should open it. And I knew instinctively that that's how much I should be talking to the camera or not. Whereas later on it became... That's how much I should be talking to the camera or not. That is another point of affiliative. She also made an interest-based statement earlier and I forgot to point it out to you guys. Uh, but the bottom line is it doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is absolutely an INFJ. So let's move on to the next person into our little typing game that we are having tonight. Uh, so let's see, here we go here, let's see, here we go here, yeah, awesome, erasing some things, we get the blue ink set up for the next one as well, blue ink, and I'm going to be opening up Discord to kind of see where we're at for the, uh... okay, so let's see here, uh, Phoebe Bowler Bridge, going to be deleting that there. Um, be grabbing some of these from uh, 10, 15. I'm not always going to do this, but uh, just going to be pasting them down here. Uh, just to have these down here. 
Okay, cool. And next one, according to this, is uh, Mark Duplass, the Kevin Pollock interview. Okay, that's what we'll do. Mark Duplass is next, folks, because uh, that is the highest uh, that we have. Good old Mark Duplass. Is it wrong that, like, I have no idea who that is? Maybe I do. We'll find out. Um, so, Mark Duplass. Uh, uh, interview Kevin Pollack. I have no idea how to spell that. Hopefully that's the correct way to spell it. Mark Duplass, Kevin Pollack chat show. Awesome. Okay. So, two bananas are sitting on the beach. The way bananas do. And they're soaking up the rays, enjoying themselves. One banana finally took is this guy like an ENFP or something? That's like the first thing that came to mind as soon as I saw this guy. I mean, an ENFP can get away with wearing a fedora. Let's be straight, you know. And then like he's talking about abstract banana situation, and it's just like, okay, what's the point you're trying to make here? I don't know. Oh wait, there's a lack of TI there. So like instantly, whoever this guy is, he just seems like an ENFP to me. Turns to the other and says, "We should go in the ocean. We should cool off, take a dip." The other banana says, "You're out of your fucking mind." I'm not going in the water. It's crazy. It's too cold. The first banana says, come on, Petey, go in the water with me. What's it going to cost you? I, I don't think it's that cold. Petey says, seriously, Chuck, go fuck yourself. I don't, I'm not going in the water. They go back and forth like this for quite a while. And finally, they settle back. That show, episode 164, everybody, 164. Um, that uh, opening um, joke, if it's not edited, yeah, there you go. He's Wants trying to, do to put a that tour, together again, right? And he's going with uh, he's going with Rodman as uh, Scarecrow. Scarecrow. Yeah, not the lead. No, you're saying no. He's stronger as a supporter. <laughs> well, as a beach person, because I'm curious. Um, late Mark 60s, early 70s. Finally. <laughs> so you're in good. Those five years make a big difference, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> all right, all right. When fair it comes enough. To that. I'll keep that on the brain. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about, first of all, if you don't mind, I've yep. not talked to many people who were raised in the, the New Orleans area. Okay. From the research, it says something about... Don't forget, guys, these streams have limited time. Whoever has the highest super chat is the person, the current highest super chat is the person who gets the top uh, pick. And uh, just so you know, if the show ends, the show ends. And we might get to your Super Chat the next week. If you're out of bed or not, it just kind of depends. Uh, there's like no actual like requirement to use previous week's Super Chats, etc. But I usually kick off the show if I don't get a Super Chat right away with whatever the highest one is the previous week. So it's a chance that you might be able to make it. So just give you guys a heads up. And while Super Chats are open right now, I'll be closing them eventually. So make sure you guys are paying attention. Not only that, when it comes to Super Chats, you guys are also making sure that you can like add additional super chats to add into what you previously bid on already. So don't forget that, folks. About the word suburb, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think of uh, New Orleans proper in my mind yeah. as a suburb. It feels more like a township. Yeah, I am. Uh, my story is a, a little less cool and, uh, and dripping with uh, case. My story is a little bit less cool cool and dripping with uh because like i'm self-deprecating ergo i'm a tife user lol tife there you go agent aroma than the average new orleans born Hello. you know person so you got me all right i got you great i grew up in a town called metairie which is uh just like a few miles west of the city oh, and nice. it's an older suburb right. um and so it's not like mcmansions and stuff like that it feels like a normal neighborhood but it feels like the midwest in metairie Wow. Um, kids on bikes, playing in the street, very safe. But then when you're like eight or nine years old, someone's older brother takes you in a car and you make your way. When you're nine years old, so when your brother takes you in a car and, you know, because like an expert sensor and remembering my memory is based on the eyes of other people instead of my own, because I could be saying I had this thing, this experience, but I'm not because I'm expert at sensing for some reason. To Midtown or Uptown or most importantly, downtown to the French Quarter and then everything changes. How far of a journey is that? It's about four or five miles. 
So you technically could walk. Metairie is, the, Tru right Metairie is the Truman Show, okay? Oh, and wow. you're there, and your parents don't want you going there. And you're five miles. And you're five miles shit. from it. And, and right when you start getting old enough to go to, to Mardi Gras, your parents start taking you on vacations during Mardi Gras because they don't want you near it. Where was your first vacation of memory that you were aware that Mardi Gras was going on? I where, was, where did you, I, in fact, go? We were in Colorado. Sure. We were skiing. Mm-hmm. Had a broken leg. Heart was playing on the radio like crazy that year. It was just. Uh, we were in Colorado. We were spraying. Uh, this thing was playing on the radio this year. Okay, that's experted sensing. It's not introverted sensing. It's one of those years. Right. Your heart was dominating the airwaves, um, and my brother did not want to be there. He's four years older than me, and and that was why he knew that. My brother did not want to be there. He was four years older than me. Again, talking about past memories through the eyes of other people. It's extroverted sensing, which means he's an SCNI user. There was Mardi Gras. There were floats. There were free things being thrown from the floats. And rumor had it, Make burning it through his school, boobs occasionally appeared. Right. So we got excited. You would think you'd get together with some... Boobs occasionally appeared, and we got excited. Okay, that sounds pretty pragmatic, if I've ever heard pragmatic. And it's also very TIFE factual and SENI. This guy also sounds pretty concrete, not going to lie. So what is this guy? I don't know. Sounds like an ISTP. Let's see, hopefully. Uh, definitely direct. He's not informative. So. Friends, and get yourself some and that And that was the next year. And that's how it starts. That's, that's how it starts. You, you're, you're ahead of the curve already. How, how old were you in that real way? You are ahead of the curve because I'm being nice to you because I'm an FE user in SENI, T-I-F-E, and I'm STP NFJ Quadra. Hello, hello, hello. Well, at my age, I should be. Yeah, well, everything's advanced in New Orleans. You know, I mean, it... it... SE users have long-term memories that are attached to other people. Take those people away or take those reminders away. They don't really have long-term memory anymore. This is why when somebody close to an SE user dies, it's as if a part of themselves has died. Whereas an SI user, if someone dies, that person can live on within the SI user. That's how that works mechanically. It, it happens real quick. Seven I think, or eight, nine? I think when I was like eight or nine, we were starting, we were starting to like Hear the word. drink beer. Sure. And, and then you know by the time I was 10, no, Dolph Dervish, we do not reimburse Super Chats. And we thank everybody's Super Chat conversation. Unused ones are not reimbursed. It's just whichever one is the highest at the time before the show ends is the one that we choose, etc. Otherwise, thank you all for your contributions. It's a little bit of risk. That's what makes this game fun. It was like, okay, we're smoking, and then you drive at 15 there. So Jay got his car when I was like 11. And then by the time I was 11... So Jay got his car when I was 11, okay starting with other people and driving there, et cetera, and it's just being all TIFE the entire time. Very direct, and uh, he's not really talking about outcomes. He's very movement. There's no outcomes with what he's talking about whatsoever, and he is responding, so direct responding, movement, and then STP, NFJ, Quadra automatically counts him as an ISTP, plus we see pragmatic and concrete. That means Mark Duplass is an ISTP, folks. There you have it, ISTP. So awesome. Also, guys, like stay away from like all the stereotypes. You know, sometimes we have cognitive focus that can get in there and get around stereotypes. You don't want to be making your typing decisions completely on stereotypes. That's not to say that I don't do it from time to time, because sometimes stereotypes are there for a reason, but don't rely on stereotypes, which is why most people end up disagreeing with me on these typings because of reliance, heavy reliance on those stereotypes. So let's, uh, let's continue. So we have Scott Peak at 30. Let's see here. And erase Mark Duplass because we got to that one there. And then uh, the next one is Scott Peak at 30 from Mr. Joseph House. Thank you for your contribution uh, tonight, sir. So let's see that. Scott Peak, you're going to be in green ink tonight. Scott Peak. Awesome. 
Sometimes the super chats carry to the next show, Jared. It's kind of like if I don't have anything to start with, then if no one super chats for a bit, I'll just kick off the show from a, the highest super chat that's left over from the previous week, which is exactly what we did tonight. Phoebe uh, Waller Bridge was what was decided to kick the show off because that was the highest super chat from the previous week that was unused. So there you there you go. All right, Scott Peak. Okay. So let's see. Crowdfunding interview with Scott Peake of Candyland based on a novel by Elizabeth uh, Engstrom. Plane chasing episode featuring Scott Peake of Base Hunters Chasing. I hope this is accurate. The correct Scott Peake, please. <laughs> Today I have with me Storm Chaser Scott Peake. Hi Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me James. Absolutely. So can we just start off by you telling me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, uh, where you're from originally? Absolutely. Um, in the beginning, uh, was adopted pretty much and uh, uh, was born in Central Texas, adopted at two months old and uh, to a family uh, that moved to Dallas and uh, grew up in the north side, uh, just on the uh, Collin County, Dallas County line. So that's uh, uh, where I grew up for the majority of my life. And uh, my parents eventually moved to Allen, just a little further north. Heather Bryant, as long as I got a record of it, uh, I don't see that being an issue. Um, so North into Collin County, and um, that's where I went through high school yeah. and, and all that, so <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, so where about, um, what did you study in high school? I mean, did you always want to be a Okay, where did like any of the visuals go? Crowdfunding, Scott Peak base. Okay, uh, let's see here. Scott Peak, Scott Peak, Tim Peak, Scott Peak. It's like, is there at, at all like any good interviews here? Or okay, three seconds. I'm not looking at that. Um, let's see. Maybe we could find something. Incredible. God's channel. So let's try. On the ground. Need more lightning. Storm chasing is pretty dope. Alright, looks like we have no choice but to suffer through this. Storm chaser, did you always want to study meteorology or? Was that something that kind of came later on? So that actually started when I was a child, uh, and it was born from a, a fear of lightning, oddly enough, uh, out of all the things. And It was born uh, from a fear of lightning. Uh, I, I just had an awful fear of lightning when I was a child. I just, I just had an it. awful so, fear oh, of so lightning. Like That's SI. That. Right, and, it, and of course, it, it's still today, I still am very cautious about lightning, no matter what. And, it, you know, I'm still, still very cautious but about it's, lightning. It's, uh, it's very dangerous, and you know, the more I've studied about it, but <laughs> over the years, uh, but through that fear, um, I started. I got curious and started to read books and try to look up how lightning worked and what the mechanics were. And through that, I discovered tornadoes, and uh, it just it looked like just something out of this world to me. You know, at a very young age of four years old, and. You know, I, of course, I didn't know what storm chasing was at that point, um, but it grew on me um, th th that that fascination for tornadoes. And yeah. you it know, when I, when I got to that I... point where uh, you know, discovered what tornado chasing was, you know, I, I uh, that was definitely initiating that was, uh, something I wanted to do. And uh, I know you had Tim Marshall on the last, the first episode, actually. Yeah, and, I did. Yeah, um, he was actually one of my inspirations. I saw him on uh, storm documentaries uh, about uh, tornadoes. And I saw him on storm documentaries. And, that's SI as well. Uh, you know that really inspired me to uh, really want to dive into to chasing. Yeah, well, I understand it completely. Dive into chasing. First kind of things that got me into storms was uh, seeing a video of the Andover tornado in Kansas back when I was 12 years old. It was on the news in England. So very much like you, I was like, wow, that, that that's a weather event. 
mm. you know, and it was just kind of uh, amazing to see something like that uh, at such a young age, and you think, wow, that's really interesting. But like you, like you said, I was I was afraid of lightning when I was a kid, mm. and I just kind of got you know more and more you know into it and kind of trying to understand it, and then of course seeing tornado <laughs> videos kind of just really piqued my interest in weather. Right, and and uh, you know through high school, you know I, I, I it still stuck with me. And uh, I was lucky enough to go to a high school that had a, 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 t a real TV station. Uh, it was a KGLE, uh, Cable Channel 17. Seems very TIFE uh, factual. Uh, broadcasting station they had there at, yeah. in the high school. And it was, uh, it's top notch in the, cu in the country. And uh, uh, they had a, a position open. Mm -hmm. uh, top notch in the country um, is technically a TE statement. Uh, a weather forecaster. And, you know, I took it and... You know, I, that's, that's where I started, you know, forecasting and, yeah, uh, you know, tweaking okay. my ability to, you know, get more accurate, you know, forecasting and uh, get that, more really, accurate that really forecast helped out. And tweaking it really my ability, taught, systematic. Uh, it taught me, uh, you know, what I needed to, to improve on. Yeah, absolutely. I mm. understand that. <laughs> uh, what was the first tornado you ever actually saw? So it, it's, it's a little murky. I don't have any videos of it, but yeah. uh, it was actually uh, out towards uh, Clinton, Oklahoma. Uh, I was with uh, one of my first uh, uh, storm chasing uh, partners and friend, uh, Mike Mejewell, and we were with uh, a gentleman named Ken Fugate, and he was uh, another uh, uh, storm chaser. Yeah. And we had taken a trip out in uh, 2004, I think, I believe it was May, and we had witnessed uh, two tornadoes uh, at the same time, and they were north of I 40, just north. We were actually looking at uh, the two tornadoes just north of I 40. But that was in 2004, and uh, uh, so it, it was uh, uh, just a, a real experience. And they weren't all that big, they were small, uh, but yeah. it was still very fascinating to, uh, to see Super informed, the first time. initiating movement. Yeah. And uh, in your years of chasing, um, what would you say has been uh, like the, the, most, the biggest tornado you've ever seen? Well, um, I'd have to go with the, uh, uh, the El Reno tornado. Uh, that was uh, uh, the largest. Uh, 2.6 miles wide, and uh, um, yeah, that was that was uh, an experience in itself. Uh, witnessing that tornado, yeah, I love lightning. I love doing lightning photography, but you know, tornadoes are my you know. No, passion. Colin Kaepernick you know, some is people not. People view storm chasing as a success in if they're getting those lightning shots they're wanting or getting the tornado shot they're wanting. It's all relative when you say success and storm yeah. chasing, and you know, I know you you're very good at. Your lightning photography it's it's fantastic okay. yeah it's yeah. definitely one of my favorites so you're good at lightning no, no, photography no, 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 it's fantastic because i have an fe user okay mm -hmm. lightning esfj or ent oh, absolutely. this guy garden variety sh thunder shower in the summer to you know supercells that just drop bolts out the top of them so and i'm pretty sure no lightning is the same no it's not <laughs> so no definitely it's not. like snowflakes it's although it can strike twice it can strike <laughs> it can twice yep <laughs> Uh, what would you say throughout your career has been your most hair-raising experience? Like, uh, when was the time that you thought, right, I really need, I am getting too close, I need to back off? Was there, was there an event that kind of sticks with you? There's a couple. Um, one of them was obviously El Reno. Yeah. Um, that one, uh, I, I think a lot of people got caught off guard, mm. and I, you can't really, you know, I can't blame them. And I, I was caught off guard as well, and mm. um, we were going due east. He was talking the, about uh, what the other guy likes, road, not, and, not what he himself uh, likes. Th that was... Uh, you know, we thought the tornado was going to drop southeast, and we were going to drop southeast with it. And uh, it storm decided to swing back to the north, and uh, along with the tornado, and uh, that was uh, uh, very, very scary. You know, driving against 50 mile an hour inflow wind, damaging inflow winds, mm. and um, that was uh, that was a hair raising moment. Another one I had was in uh, Sand Springs, Oklahoma. Mm. And uh, I, forgive me, I don't remember the dates, but uh, you know, I can always go back and look. But um, uh, that was uh, on uh, Interstate 412, just west of Tulsa. It was very hilly out there. I'm sure you know. It's just uh, it's what is, is what is, what is. There's just no uh, what if. It's just concrete, of, concrete, concrete. Uh, Tulsa. Yeah, definitely. And, Super uh, concrete. Uh, we were traveling westbound, uh, and there was a partially rain wrapped tornado mm -hmm. in the rain. There was this uh, tornado, I and then I did this thing. The south could see it better than we could. Yeah. Because the tornado was I know actually people blending in with see the colors of the rain. It's concrete. So it's this guy is the inception. Uh, and um, it's a, a limited access highway. Yeah. So you can't just.
All right. So Scott Peak is ESFJ. Pat. So let's move on to the next one. Awesome. Let's reset the board here. Resetting the board. Awesome. We'll go back to red ink and pull up the scored here. Okay. So add to Brownie 003 for Peter Till. So that's 25. And then Peter Till. Where is Peter Till? That's 10. So that would be 35. So 35 means that would be the current highest one. So we are moving towards uh, Peter Thiel is now. Okay, let's do this. Peter Thiel interview. Awesome. Allergies are crazy out here. The Rubin Report. Okay, let's do it. Normally, you sort of to get people to start doing something like this, it has to be something where there's an intense need, and um, and maybe it's not too dangerous. And so the you know one of the natural places it started was on the eBay auction site where you had small dollar transactions, maybe forty dollars for the typical amount, and uh, if you send a check across the country, that's like a seven to ten delay, ten day delay. It's mm -hmm. slow. Um, most most people aren't set up to process credit cards. Your roommate probably couldn't process credit cards, <laughs> and so. Uh, and so, you if, but since you could make PayPal payments with a credit card, you could in effect send a credit card payment to um, 300 million people, whereas there are only something like three or four million that are set up to process. Uh, um, cr there are like 150 million people with emails in the U.S. at the time, mm -hmm. and there may be three million that were set up to process credit cards, small businesses, things like that. So, so he offered a credit card statistic. That's definitely a TEFI statement. Also talking about money and the way that he's doing this too points for TE currently. We expanded it by, you know, 147 million. Do you remember what it... F we expanded it by 147 million. That's also another TE statement. I'm going to say that's also a point for expert in sensing, saying that the action was a Felt wee like statement. as it started... Com that can be expert intuition, but not really seeing that because it wasn't a what if. It's more of a what is concrete statement. Expert in sensing is more concrete. Pounding the way you're talking about well, it. Like it was, what it, it was, felt like as it was growing and you realized like, wow, we really have this thing. Well, you now. are, you know, you're at the, at the, at the forefront of like some... Well, you are, you're at the forefront of this thing. Wow, if I haven't heard initiating, I don't know what is Annie's direct, so uh, definitely seems very outcome focused as well. So I'm going to say direct initiating control uh, for that sort of revolutionary thing. It, uh, it's incredibly uh, exciting and it's incredibly scary. And it was, uh, it was like we're going to take over the world or we're all going to die. And you, you move several times between, you know, um, that those two uh, several times a day. Yeah. Was uh -huh. there any bizarre pushback from banks or any anyone that was doing well, financial was, tra were, transactions there, traditionally? It, there were cer certainly like more than more than our share of challenges. You had a, you had an enormous problem of fraud where people just uh, figured out ways to hack the system and steal money. We had an enormous problem with fraud, fraud, and people would hack the system and steal money. This is what people would do. Uh, so he's still very direct. He also initiated that point entirely very outcome focused, direct initiating control. And he seems to be talking about the best way to do things, which would pipe him as systematic. That would mean he's SFP, uh, NTJ Quadra, the only thing that's systematic there. That means he's ENTJ or he is INTJ, one of the two. Let's keep going. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and you can't simply get rid of fraud because you can always get rid of fraud if you make it cumbersome. But if it's easy, then it's also easy to defraud. Can't get rid of fraud, you know, uh, that's as expert at sensing as well. So sure. the challenge was how do you get it to be easy to use but hard to defraud? And that took you know, took some time. There. I do not recommend ESTP join, uh, dating an INTJ. I mean, they got really good emotional compatibility but almost no sexual compatibility. Um, certainly uh, banks did. Make sure to verify whether or not that INTJ is actually an ISTJ. Because if that's the case, that's a golden pair. Didn't like it. There were, you know, there were all the, the incumbent players that, that didn't like something new. And then, of course, it was sort of in this, um, 
in this. Uh, oh, talking about all these incumbent players who didn't like something new. Okay, yeah, that's pragmatic. That's also extroverted sensing as well. But ENTJ and INTJ are both uh, pragmatic anyway. But we know he's direct initiating control. So yeah, there you go. He's an ENTJ. There's really no point in moving forward with this. But yeah, Peter Thiel is an ENTJ. So awesome. Let's move on to the next one and see uh, who has the uh, current top bid. It's getting. Uh, well, I'm gonna need to get an assistant pretty soon to keep track of all this stuff with me. Holy smokes! All right, so let's see here. Uh, let's keep going here. Let's keep going here. Awesome. And uh, let's see who's next. I'm going to delete Peter Thiel off the list. And let's see here, Peter Thiel is deleted. Um, okay, so Ozzy Osbourne, Eddie Murphy. So it looks like we got Johnny Depp. Oop, Princess Diana's up there as well. But let me double check Ozzy Osbourne. Let's see, where is the previous Ozzy Osbourne? There it is. Okay, $14.99 and then $9.99. So Princess Diana is still above. All right, so Princess Diana is next. That's cool. I, I like uh, these choices that we're getting uh, for royalty. Uh, Princess Diana interview. Let's see that. Something bad will happen. Okay. Do you think you will ever be queen? No, I don't. No. No, I don't. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. I uh, like myself seeing, I don't know, like, is that like scripted? Uh, is that like, is that real? I don't know if that's real, but. That's okay. I mean, it, it might be. Uh, I really don't know. Is that like, I mean, it could be real if it's like Effie Hero, but who knows. Um, let's just assume it is for now. I mean, not sure, but uh, let's try to gather as much effort, evidence as we can about uh, the late Princess Diana. Um, and definitely a queen of people's hearts, etc. That is an Effie statement, so... I don't think many people would want me to be queen. Actually, when I say many people, I mean the establishment that I'm married into because they've decided that I'm a non-starter. Oh, wow. That is some powerful stuff. Gosh, maybe I should look into uh, Princess Diana a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm liking what she's saying. <laughs> she's like firing off that anti-establishment stat standpoint talking about the establishment that i've been married into wow that's pretty cool uh and again another tife statement um uh, and uh these are the people i've married into gonna have to put a point down for experted sensing for that but let's keep going um why do you think they've decided that because i do things differently because I don't go by a rule book. Because I don't go by a rule book and I do things differently. Pragmatic. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Princess Diana is pragmatic. That's great. Because I lead from the heart, not the head. And albeit that's got me into trouble in my work, I understand that. But someone's got to go out there and love people and show it. Someone's got to go out there and love people and show it, said every STP NFJ quadra. Okay, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Not playing by the rules, but she still kind of seems maybe affiliative as well with what she's saying. Yeah, you know, because guess what? I mean, even affiliative NFJs, if they're STP focused, they don't necessarily, you know, are playing by the rules per se. So, and she really talking about the right thing? This is pretty hard. Seems a little scripted, but uh, not sure. I'm gind to of put a point down for affiliative anyway. Uh, kind of transitioning here. Likely because it's scripted. I think it is. So, and do you think that because of the way you behave, that's precluded you effectively from becoming queen? Yes, I well not precluded me. I wouldn't say that. 
Oh, not precluded me. I wouldn't say that. Ooh, correcting him mid sentence. That's a TI statement. I like this. I like the TI. This is getting good. Um, I just don't think I have as many supporters in that environment than I did. Than I did. Yeah. You mean within the royal household? Mm -hmm. I don't think I have as many supporters in that environment as as I did. Again, that's another extroverted sensing statement. Talk about supporters, people who are loyal to me. That is extroverted sensing. She is speaking some, uh, laying down some truth bombs now, Princess Diana. This is dope. Mm, enjoying this one. And uh, I got to put down another paint, uh, point on pragmatic there. That was pretty... Uh, that seemed pretty pragmatic, uh, not gonna lie. Um, and uh, kind of seems pretty responding uh, as well. Um, doesn't, uh, we'll see how that goes. Let's see. They see me as a, a threat of some kind. And I'm here to do good. I'm not, a dis I'm not a destructive person. Why do they see you as a threat? I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path, and I think it's the strength. I think every uh, woman in history has had to walk down a similar path. That is extroverted sensing, introverted intuition, and uh, she's also very direct uh, in that statement as well. Very direct. It causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Why do the public still support her when I say public? Ooh, this is just TI statement after TI after TI. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? You know, awesome TI statements. Public, you're going into an engagement and there's a great many people there. Thank you so much for watching. The cool. I want to see some more. Let's check out what other, what other interviews we can glean, I wonder. Hmm, I want a different one. Different one. Royal Wedding. Uh, Princess Diana, Prince Charles, interview 1981. Let's see how this, uh, how Diana confronted Camilla in her own words. Uh, Charles and Diana together, um, Diana in her own words, documentary. Let's see, uh, engagement interview, my mother royal documentary, Prince Harry, Prince Diana tapes. Let's see here. Six royal rules that Princess Diana didn't follow just seems super pragmatic. Your Royal Highness, Lady Diana, since the engagement was announced, you've both uh, done quite a bit of traveling and you've met a, a large number of people. What sort of reactions have you encountered to your marriage? Oh, the most uh, overwhelming uh, and touching reactions as far as uh, me being concerned. I, I uh, of course, went to New Zealand and, and Australia. Oh, I, of course, uh, went to New Zealand and Australia because I am an affiliative F-I-T-E user, likely an ESTJ. Look at how regal I come off. It's all the time. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, and it's just like, okay, come on, Prince Charles. I mean, are, you, are like, I mean, let's be straight. Come on, man. And uh, Venezuela and then America on the way back. This was in uh, April, May, and there are people... Ah, some smiling faces. And just... Um, you reacted to this warmth and affection. It has been a tremendous boost. And just a mass of smiling faces. It's wonderful. Quite emotional, too. Oh, very, very, yes. Of course, thousands of people are, are joining in your wedding festivities in a very practical way, aren't they? I'm thinking of all the, the street parties and collections for charities and so on. Have you had to become very involved in, in that? And I think roughly since we got engaged, there's been about 100,000 letters. Look at that level of self-discipline that she's just trying to hold herself down because you can obviously tell that she thinks this is a complete, utter waste of time. <laughs> she's like, I'm trying not to fidget and look like I just don't care. So she's like putting, focusing all that on her fingers, you know. <laughs> Which, I mean, I wanted to be able to take the opportunity to say how really, really grateful we are for such... I mean, incredible kindness. I can't get over it. And I think there have been, what now, something like uh, 3,000, over 3,000 presents. And I looked this morning, and there's a corridor uh, stacked with, I don't know, 40 sacks full of... Yeah, that was responding. She was direct responding, and definitely movement, very process-oriented. Direct responding, movement, and then STP, NFJ, Quadra. 
I am very surprised to say that we have ourselves an ENFJ focused ISTP. And if you can think about that, she'd have to be ENFJ focused because growing up uh, in the royal family and you're literally being forced to do things against your will when you have an I child, you know, and uh, you're very pragmatic, that would be a serious, serious issue. And as she gains in popularity with FE aspirational, if she really was against this establishment of the royal family and the crown and whatnot, from a political standpoint, those who really have actual power uh, within uh, the royal family per se, think about it this way. You look at the 48 laws of power according to Robert Greene, right? Law one is never outshine the master. Princess Diana constantly outshined the master. And given that she's pragmatic and one that could actually inspire some actual change, that could be, uh, you know, that could be, you know, very, you know, within there, I, you know, and I'd be like, you know, yeah, that'd be great if she really was an ENFJ. I'm just not seeing it, guys. I'm really not seeing it. She seems really, really pragmatic. She's also very responding. Uh, she's not really so controlled because she's not talking about outcomes, even in the last interview. Let's look at some more. Let's look at some more. See if we can like disprove her being an ISTP. Presence mail so which we can't get through. And uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. You've obviously had a staggering amount of mail and I'm sure you've been able to look at some of it yourselves. Is there anything that's particularly touched you? Well, for me, all the things that come from children We've obviously spent hours oh, well, someone please think of the children. Cards, I mean, like I'm sure all the baked at home. the people who are into the Jeffrey oh, Epstein yes. case would like case. to hear that from Princess Diana. <laughs> so many smarties, you can hardly see them. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. It's really nice. You had a very special collage from the children at the kindergarten. Yes, I collected it last Friday when I went to the entertainment party, which I ended up being battered and bruised. And there's so <laughs> many children crawling on top of me. But they Which I ended up being bashed and booze. And a class representing young England. It was lovely, really nice. Super. What, what does it actually show on the collage? Well, it's the firework display that's going to happen on Tuesday. The one I'm not going to. <laughs> it's the fireworks display that happens on next Tuesday. The one I am not going to because she wants to go. It's her NI child. I want to go do that, but I have to do the right thing. I am being forced against my will to behave in a certain way for the sake of the royal family and the sake of the establishment instead of actually being my own person. How many of you people in this audience are in similar situations as an STP in your life where you're born into this family that's very affiliative, all about doing the right thing, and you are having your freedom taken away from you when you're literally mentally a libertarian, and it's like, oh, when do I get my freedom of choice? And it's like, because she consistently exercised her freedom of choice, that made certain people feel, you know, uncomfortable, right? Maybe, maybe that's why Princess Diana died for all you conspiracy theorist people out there. Who knows? But I guarantee you, her being as pragmatic as she is, low-key pragmatic, trying to hide her pragmatism, definitely made her not remotely popular amongst the affiliative types who actually rule the royal family and the crown within the UK. You might want to think about that, all right? Like, this happens all the time in politics, folks. Remember, never outshine the master. There's a reason why the laws of power are written the way that they are. And I would venture to imagine that Princess Diana is a victim of never outshine the master. Let's be straight. So, okay, cool. We are definitely moving on. Uh, Princess Diana, ISTP, unbelievable, and uh, a fantastic typing, if I do say so myself. I really enjoyed this, guys, folks. I didn't know much about Princess Diana at all until now, and it's nice to be able to look into her character, and I can understand why people thought the world of her uh, for sure uh, in that regard. So... Uh, very, very concrete uh, and uh, pragmatic and talking about what the children get out of the situation. Uh, no abstraction at all. Uh, no what if scenarios at all. It's just cut and dry. This is what's actually happening. I can see that her and her husband, you know, while Charles may have been a dick to her, they had a golden pair. Maybe they actually did have a really good relationship. So that's just something to consider. But uh, 
you know, because someone in the audience pointed out that, you know, he was a dick to her, but I'm just not really sure. So who knows? I mean, there was that there was a potential for a golden pair there. So we'll see how that goes. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. Thank you uh, for the Princess Diana one. That was excellent. And I believe, well, we have Johnny Depp next. Uh, we have um, uh, Boris Van Droof with Ozzy Osbourne. And then we have, I believe, another Ozzy Osbourne, which makes Ozzy Osbourne the top one right now. So we're going to be doing Ozzy Osbourne next. So let's do that. Uh, let's go into some green for Ozzy Osbourne. Cool, Ozzy Osbourne. And also, folks, I am going to turn off uh, the super chats as well tonight. So super chats are officially closed. They are officially closed. So we'll get to that as well. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I saw a 49.99. Oh, uh, MJ, I already did talking with famous people, host Eric. We typed him as an ESTP recently. So Mr. MJ, with your super crazy amounts, 49.99 uh, super chat, please change that to a different uh, person please. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, that would be great. Uh, so it's already been typed. So in the meantime, I'm going to do Ozzy Osbourne and then, uh, hopefully MJ just ping me, uh, uh, ping me in the channel, uh, which one it is, unless you're like demanding that I do a verification of Eric again. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could probably look at that, but, uh, haven't I done Ozzy Osbourne? I don't want another one. So he wants another video breakdown for Eric, huh? Another, everyone wants me to do Eric Strauss again. Okay. Well, at least for the entertainment value. Okay. Well, I don't remember doing Ozzy Osbourne but maybe I did if I did please inform me but can verify that just to double check here let me log into the website and take a look at our famous persons list so let's see here personality types of famous persons and famous person list everyone says that I said he was an ENTP let's see no, Ozzy Osbourne is not on the ENTP list, so I'm going to open them all. Nope, nope, nope. Don't see that there. Don't see that there. No. Nope, not seeing it there. No, no. Uh, so, nope. Okay, uh, opening ENFP. No, no. Don't see Ozzy Osbourne. Don't see Ozzy Osbourne. Nope. And don't see Ozzy Osbourne, no, and no, and nope, and according to the list I have, I have not done Ozzy Osbourne, so that's just not going to, uh, good, okay, so, okay, I'm going to do Ozzy, and if MJ flat out says do Eric again, we'll do Eric again. Uh, but uh, we're going to do Aussie real quick until I get a ping from uh, MJ that says exactly what he wants. Please ping me in the chat, good sir. I'd appreciate it uh, in terms of what you want me to do. And uh, we will go at it from there. So. The program you're about to watch. Okay, so interview with Ozzy Osbourne. Let's do an old one. 1982 sounds good to me. Awesome. Okay, night flight interview. Cool. The sound is bad. Well, in actual fact, if you want, if you want me to be funny, I bit my own head off. But it, in, in actual fact, some guy went at one gig on the last tour threw a bat on stage, and, and every night we do a gig. You get all these crazy people that come and throw these, these junk on stage, and you know. All right, guys, if you want to know the famous 
uh, typings list. I'm gonna put it in the chat. You guys can check it out. Go there, go to that link and see who we've typed already just to make sure everything's straight, okay? So. I thought it was one of these rubber bats. I picked it up, it was a real bat. Was you know? it alive? Well, it was till I bit the head of it, you know? Yes. The next thing we want to get you out of the You can't say way. nothing about that now, can you? What? Oh, you can't say anything about that, can you? Talking about uh, talking about biting the hat off, uh, head off of a bat, which is uh, pragmatic, and he was initiating, initiated, cut her off midpoint. I could, sure, you can say anything you want. I mean, the taste of bats is very salty. Taste of salt. The taste of bats is very salty. It tastes of salt because I'm an introverted sensor. That's cool. Tastes like anything else? Well, yes, but I can't really say that on the air, can I? Really? No. Well, yes, but I can't say that on the air, but very much well can I. Okay, that's F-E, and he was insinuating, and that was pragmatic, and oh, well, I can't say that on the air. Well, can I? That's informative. He was being informative. That's cool. Next, we want to see your tattoos, because we've heard you have the most incredible tattoos. Can I you show them to us? Oh, here. Oh, that's beautiful. It's great, don't you think? Tattooed by the bat. <laughs> and do you have any others? Many more. I'm, I'm covered in them. Wait, so let's see that one again. Mm. That's my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's my mother-in-law. your reputation... That is a TIF statement. <laughs> ...is that of a wild man. We want to know how that started. If I can try and explain this situation... In one, I don't know. It's like I think there's a wild man in everybody. You know, it's like all I am is a conductor of mayhem. I like to see people get off in a good way. I like to give myself to people as Ozzy. Ozzy is a very, sometimes very unhappy person because of one side of it, my life. It's like constant work and and and, and the and the. Um, Speaking about himself in the third person, which he just did there, is actually very indicative of an NTP. That happens all the time. Uh, for um, Now, I know people say that speaking in the third person is, uh, is a definition of insanity, etc. I have noticed uh, that when people are speaking in the third person, anecdotally speaking, the majority of the time, they're NTPs. Understanding that people know me and, and and like what i do a lot of people do people know me and like what i do they like what i do that is an fe statement t-i-f-e statement i'm very privileged in that respect but there's a side i'm very privileged in that respect that's also fe self-deprecation as well as talking about uh, an internal introverted sensing experience me that wants to say hey you know i want to go fishing in the lake you know i want to go whatever i want to do you know i want to do everything what everybody else does but because of what I am. People talk about drug use changing personality over time. I mean, it can happen with severe trauma, severe brain trauma, and, and adjustments of your brain chemistry. I mean, just like stimulants or depressants can cause cognitive transition. But honestly, I, I don't know. I, I'm just typing the guy as is. It's possible, but I don't have enough evidence to make a judgment about that. I'm only typing what I see here. Um, because of who I am, the Aussie, I said to you earlier on before we came on the air, I'm a split, split person. Okay, he just, he just uh, interrupted himself, changed his statement. He was informative there, and he's moving. So he's informed, initiating movement. He's obviously SFJ, NTP Quadra. Uh, the amount of tattoos, uh, as, as well as, uh, you know, cussing on the air and whatnot, indicates pragmatic. Most affiliative people don't do that, while some affiliated people can cuss on the air. And I've noticed some INFJs. Uh, being willing to do that when they are affiliative and they're ESTP focused, but not so much. And uh, when he said, oh, that's my mother-in-law pointing to his tattoo, that was actually an abstract statement as well. Uh, not really uh, concrete, I would say, but it's between ESFJ and ENTP. So, and I think it's pretty obvious what he is, but let's keep going. Personality, Ozzy Osbourne. Check against 2019, okay. That's what we'll do. We'll do 2019. Let's see. 
or Nevi. Oh, okay, let's do 2019. Here we go. Here we are on Aussie's Boneyard. It's another brand new episode of Aussie Speaks, and I'm Billy Morrison. And I'm Ozzy Osbourne. I'm here, folks. Yes, you are. How and I'm Ozzy Osbourne. I'm here, folks. Uh, still initiating. Still initiating. How's, how's 2019 been for you, mate? It's been one of the most fucked up years <laughs> of my life. I broke my neck in January. I... I broke my neck in January because I'm an SI user and I'm still pragmatic. LOL. Okay. Pneumonia, I've had fucking blood clots, I've had everything this year. So you're feeling well? Uh, you know, usual. You look good, actually. I mean, I... Well, I say, I, but, but when people are dead, they look... <laughs> <laughs> When people are dead, look, that was also, that was uh, abstract. That was also pragmatic. Oh, my gosh. That was actually funny. All right. And uh, uh, he initiated that point as well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think we've proven that he is definitely a, an ENTP. So there you go. All right. Ozzy Osbourne is the ENTP. And awesome. Cool. Does uh, MJ have any opinions about uh, doing Eric Strauss and which videos specifically? Hmm. Let's see. One of his videos where he's bad mouthing me is probably Mr. MJ's approach uh, to this. Who knows? Let's see. I mean, I'll choose a video. Uh, maybe one of his more current ones. Let's see. An excellent marketing tactic if you guys think about it. I mean, you know, that's what he's getting out of this, right? So. Okay, let's do that. Uh, Eric, talking with famous people. Okay. Video. Hello and welcome. All right, cool. Hellstones. All right, let's talk hellstones. I ain't gonna be in that now. We already the thumb is already. Done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi friends, host Eric here. Who is TJ? I think. Hi yes. Isaiah Ruth. Uh, anyway, so like, I don't. Is there any uh, actual video here, or is it just like frozen in time? There. Uh, let's see. Dark triad disorders and type. Okay. That sounds interesting. It might be my computer's having a hard time playing the video on this. Okay. It's too bad that I have like really bad computer ness right now. It's only presumptuous and entitled, way more so than she has any business being with me. That's step one. But but that's fine. She's a kid. I expect that shit. The real problem is when I. Well, that's fine. I I expect that shit. You know because like I am pragmatic. Okay, Eric Strauss. Eric Strauss. I just wish I could actually like have some moving video here, which is really frustrating. I tried to talk to her about it. She didn't want to work with me. She didn't want to hear me. She didn't want to respond on a point. She ignored what I was saying. She chose to be a cunt. Oh, wow. Okay, you're saying that, you know, okay. That's uh. Nice little uh, label there. Um, she chose to do this. Uh, okay, she did this, basically. It's pretty direct. Um, let me actually do an incognito window. Um, let's go to YouTube. Let's do it this way. Eric talking with famous people. Let's do it this way. And uh, dark triad disorders. 
won't be long, but it'll be happy, happy song. Well, yeah, I've not really seen very many ENTPs play music, but okay. Uh, you know, that sounds kind of SP-ish to me. That's extra great sensing, you know. Um, it's too bad that I uh, still can't uh, get that to play there. Let me see. Let's skip ahead. It's Wednesday, good. It's going in and out, in and out. Let's see. Expectations? Well, my I have my own expectations, and you can take your expectations and shove them up your ass, is withdrawal. Mixed with a little eight. <laughs> you can shove them up the ass part. Uh, but I think, I actually think avoid, confront, withdraw is a good order of operations. Uh, I don't seek out conflict. I try to avoid it. When I face it, I try to win the battle. If it looks like it's going to be too long of a war, I quit. <laughs> you know? Yes, yeah, Sporties, I'm aware I just typed an ENTP physician. I was being facetious. Come on. Like, there's a reason I said that. <laughs> I mean, maybe he is an ENTP, right? <laughs> the thing is, that, that assumes that there's some sort of back and forth going on. There's no back and forth going on. I'm just waiting to pounce when I have the opportunity. Um... I think, I'm, I think, I don't know why I'd call it motivation. I'd say sort of uh, self-concept strategy, you know? It's like, where does your self-concept come from? Does it come from your relationship with fear foremost? Like, obviously, I really don't like fear. That's why seven's my dominant number. Enneagram is, well, look, Enneagram's a little bit more of a, of a legit framing tool than tarot because um, at least it taxonomies first core negative emotions. And I, I think it does so successfully. I can't really think of other core negative emotions that don't fit under Okay, it's like I think that does that successfully. Successfully, Enneagram is more of a technology because he's comparing Enneagram to Tarot in this statement. So it's T I F E uh, talking about you know uh, like you know the facts around that, and then extroverted sensing versus introverted new intuition saying what it is is being concrete in this particular moment though, saying like what is still very outcome focused. But let's keep going underneath that those frames so i'm going to try to find something with him actually interacting with like another person let's see instead of there we go hey everyone welcome to another typology interview we have two special guests we have alpha males from two different uh locations here i'm ready to duke it out um just joking just maybe i'll put in like fight one two three <laughs> yeah let's do it <laughs> yeah um, That's what but, my audience wants yeah, to see. Yeah, so we, I, I don't think you guys need to... Oh, what Eric said there was an initiation. He just initiated. That wasn't necessarily his turn to talk. He just initiated there. That's cool. Introductions. We have Dave Powers from Tribe Objective Personality and host Eric from Tribe Talking with Famous People, and we're ready to go. How's it going, guys? It's going great. I'm not sure what we're debating. What do we want to talk I don't about? Even know. I don't think we're debating anything. We're just, like, hanging yeah. out. Yeah, great. <laughs> How's it going, Eric? You going good? Uh yeah, it's going good, and uh, I'll tell you that in the time between when we scheduled this and today when it happened, I've had a lot of people express a lot of enthusiasm for seeing this upcoming video. Oh, so. really? I've had a lot of people express enthusiasm for seeing this kind of video, okay? That's uh, that's expert sensing, talk about the experience of the audience and what people value, that's expert feeling. Okay, nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Cool. That's great. Yeah, um, so... Um, so you guys are both like pretty into typology. We, I interviewed both of you separately, so I don't think we really need to get into that too much. But I was just wondering, maybe we can talk about um, 
currently what's like the Myers-Briggs system and what you guys think about Myers-Briggs and what needs to happen with it or if is it okay can we just keep it so maybe let's start with host Eric let's see what's going on what's your opinion on Myers-Briggs well I think the straightforward Myers-Briggs approach is um, adequate if you're only using typology for uh, a work thing now the test I think that MBTI is only adequate if you're only using it for a work thing. If you're only using it for a work thing, that's SI. It's only adequate in this uh, concrete scenario. Uh, saying it's a work thing, this is what you're getting out of it's best if you use it for a work thing. Uh, okay, you know, I could state that that's actually a systematic statement. Um, but he has size of his mind is systematic. That is a, a systematic statement for sure. Um, and, uh, but he's stating what it is and what it does. So that's experted sensing as well. Uh, let's keep going. I still aren't adequate in terms of actually identifying what type there, but I think the idea that I don't need to pay attention to the back slot functions and I can type, I can type in. I don't need to pay attention to the back slot functions. That's very pragmatic. Okay. Inter introverts as by their second function like so you know that uh isfjs are have fe second function so they call them isfjs because they say they're displaying their second function in the work environment so if you're just trying to talk about mbti is defining okay these people are doing this these people are doing that so that's expert sensing okay so obviously stp and fj quadra as we could see so far based on what we've gathered displays of how people are going to engage in a work environment then i think it's it and how people are going to engage in a work environment and he's not providing any like how i feel about myself he's being ti factual talking about the facts from his point of view it's inadequate but not fundamentally flawed in any sense it's inadequate but not fundamentally flawed in any sense that's a ti statement but like not fundamentally flawed that's an fe statement saying that there's still value to be had there he's very direct uh and he's talking about the outcome of um you know giving someone uh you know using it for like a work scenario okay fair enough okay but yeah. if you're talking about it any other way then it's not good not good like okay go into that a little more yeah well, if you're using it for to say, like, this is your type as a person. Um, yes, I realize I've done Eric Strauss before. But someone just dropped 50 bucks for this, so we're going to do it. Um, then it's it's not going to work very well because it's designed to get a, a survey of your displays. And if your survey of displays may be consistent with IS. It's designed to get a survey of your displays, which is experted sensing, and that's concrete as well. It's pragmatic. Except Jay, but that's not actually gonna be. Science wants from looking back at all of, we find some type of objective setting that doesn't involve 30, you know? So that's right. where we came up with like the test retail. Now, what else can we do? What we're ultimately looking for is that problems. And then um, being a uh, six system. It needs to be addressed first is if we're making a map right now, what is the thing that's the topography? And the answer. What is the thing that is the typography? And the answer, T-I-F-E, more concrete, very direct. And uh, what is the outcome? What is the thing that we're creating it about? Well, the outcome is obviously the typography, very outcome focused. Why do you guys, why does anyone think this guy's an ENTP? Like seriously, where's the movement? Where's the process? It's a dynamic system. So we're modeling a dynamic system. And the way to model a dynamic system is to reduce it to agents, vectors, objects, and fields in a way that can actually be coded into a simulation of a dynamic system. Okay, yeah, again, stating what is, what is, uh, you know, Again, more outcomes, very direct. I don't, I don't need to go further. This guy is an ESTP, you know, pretty simple. Like what I, I, I can't, I can't like, I'm sorry, he's an ESTP, very similar, but he hasn't said anything abstract this entire time. He may be talking about abstract concepts, but he's just saying what they are, okay? Just because you talk about MBTI or cognitive functions or 
calculus vectors, etc. does not necessarily mean you two are abstract. He's definitely perceiving hero, but he's not any hero, guys. He's just not. So let's let's move on. Um, so. All right, moving on to the next one. Thank you all for uh, that that uh, had to uh, put up with um, doing this again for those of you that were here the last time. But you know, we got a very large super chat for this, and we were honoring that. And uh, MJ was very clear, even though I asked him to change it. I want to do Eric Strauss again for verification purposes. So fair enough, we did Eric Strauss yet again. So. Thank you very much, MJ, for your contribution. I still appreciate it. Um, so let's go back into here and we're going to delete that one. And then, uh, all right, the next one, uh, we just did Ozzy Osbourne as well. Um, uh, you know, and uh, let's get that one out there, cool. All right, so we got Magnus Carlson uh, at twenty dollars. We got Johnny Depp at twenty four ninety nine. Uh, adding on to Jimi Hendrix, uh, which was before, I believe. Um, so let's see, where's Jimi Hendrix in there? Okay, yeah. So looks like the next one is Johnny Depp with Lady J. Johnny Depp, it is. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do Johnny Depp in red. Uh, let's do some red ink for Johnny Depp. We can do that. Cool. All Johnny Depp interview. Cool. Interview 2016. Do you know all these people? Or... <laughs> uh, now, there's been stuff in the papers. I don't know if it's true. Are you moving here, Johnny? Is this the move to Manchester? Yes. It's possible, I guess. <laughs> okay. Is this the move to uh, Manchester? I mean, it's possible, I guess. I Okay, I'm going to put down a point for informative on that one. I mean... Have you gone to see a house in Manchester? No, I haven't. No, I've actually never been to Manchester. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've always wanted to go, but yeah, no, I've never been. Okay. I've never been to Manchester. Okay. Uh, gonna have to say uh, introverted sensing on that one. So, so but I'll take a house there. I mean, why you not? Do it. Ooh, initiating. He just initiated there because he just cut off that guy. Awesome. Yeah. You can guess. Apparently, I already live in Bath as well. Oh, really? Yeah, I was seen buying spatulas and stuff. I was seen buying spatulas? Okay. Good, that's a very good celebrity sighting. Johnny Depp buying a spatula in bar. Yeah. It might be my favorite of my own. Yeah. It might be my favorite. Okay, that's kind of going to have to put down a uh, point of abstract. Uh, T-I-F-E, um, S-I-N-E as well. Uh, definitely still informative. Uh, let's keep going. <laughs> uh, now, you're in town because uh, the new movie, Alice Through the Looking Glass, it's yeah. coming out on the 27th of May. I knew the first movie was a success. I didn't realize how big it took over a billion dollars. It's one of the most successful films of all time. Is that right? Yeah. What? Which one? Alice, a Alice. More than an uh, X-Men? More than anything. More than bad uh, education? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Alice Through the Looking Glass. Can you guys not hear this? I just want to double check. Glass, uh, you return as the Mad Hatter, and in this one, Alice is traveling through time. Yes. Okay. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and everyone's... Yes. Just a straight-up T.I. statement. Yes. Back. Matt Lucas is back. Helen Bottom Carter. But Sasha Baron Cohen is in this one. No, he's not back. No, he's not back, but he's in it. He's, he's in it. Who, who... Oh, yeah, of course he's in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, so, yeah, Sasha's... Uh, he plays time. So something I've noticed about this particular video, for some reason, it's only coming in to the left. For some reason, it's not balancing out between both sides of the microphones. That's probably why. He plays Father Time, basically. And um, it was, we've we, we known each other for a good long while and I've always admired him, you know. Um. 
He plays Father Time. We've always known each other for a good while, but I've always admired him. You know, if he just left it there, it would have been extroverted sensing. But then he's like, well, but I've always admired him as a result. So it's introverted sensing. It's also uh, showing admiration for another person. That's usually extroverted feeling. Uh, so it's still, uh, still informative. Um, and uh, poor guy looks asleep at the wheel. Um, but let's keep going. Let's try to switch over to different. <laughs> A lot. I don't right. care how much, you know. Right. And I, I also stay home a lot, but I do this every day, so I'm used to it. But I would assume for someone like you, and this is part of it, because a, a movie set is very different than the press part. And the press yeah. part is, and people love you, so they go crazy when they see you, so there's a lot of noise. But it's, a, it's a very different thing when you're playing a character. You, you know what I mean? As a character, you can do virtually anything. Um, but as yourself, you know. Awkward? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah, very awkward. And do you, when you... you could as a character, you could do anything, but as yourself, you know, not necessarily. So that's that's a TIFE statement. Uh, stay in the fact, but then it's like, okay, well, people's values and the ethics involving that, that's not necessarily the case. So fair enough. And uh, as yourself, you know, where I did like dot, 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 there's kind of ellipses there. That's informative. Johnny Depp is being informative with that statement, leaving a lot to be unsaid. Because you played some really iconic characters, and when you read a script and... Uh, and they're always really these, you know, uh, how I want to look. Do you start with a look, or do you, is, is that where it starts with you? Uh, something, you know, it, generally, like, in, within the first ten pages of the script, mm -hmm. something hits, something clicks, and uh, you feel like there's something that you can add to the, to the piece, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, that, that might not have been done before, you know, right. that, you know, so. You see that there's something that you could add to the piece, which might not have been done before. And that is definitely uh, some abstraction. Uh, that's uh, something I like to call originality. And uh, if this guy is the type that I think he is, they are also known as the originators. So uh, he's not really talking about the, uh, he's not talking about the outcomes. He's gonna have to put him down his movement. So starter type, uh, which would make him SFJ and TP Quadra which would mean that he would have to be ESFJ or ENTP. And uh, with this, at this point, uh, it's looking like ENTP. Let's keep going. It's pretty much that. And then the, then the, 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 the images start to come. The, right. the look starts to come. Well the images start to come. The look starts to come. That's not uh, control-based. If he was control that would be, he'd be talking about outcomes and like, this is exactly what I do, this is why I do it. This is actually very movement because he's talking about the process of how he's getting in character. But were you ever uh, like going down a, 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 a trail of like, oh, this is what this character's gonna look like and then gone completely another way or did they all end up like you think they're gonna look? Pretty much, they, they pretty much all ended up the, 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 the way they were gonna look and the way they were gonna behave, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like the idea behind Willy Wonka, there's certain ingredients you add to these characters, and uh, right. like Willy Wonka, for example, was... Certain ingredients you add to these characters, uh, very movement, and then he just, Willy Wonka, for example, he's initiating, he initiated that point. Uh, I imagined what George Bush would be like, incredibly... <laughs> I imagined what George Bush would be like, you know, in that situation, so that's also another abstract uh, concept as well. Um, and uh, doesn't really seem like he's trying to do the right thing and with basically anything. I'm gonna put a point down for uh, pragmatic. And he's talking about his system or way of doing things specifically for uh, acting. Uh, so there you have it, folks. He is an ENTP. Johnny Depp is an ENTP. So that's pretty cool to have Mr. Depp added to the originators, the fellow originators like myself. He is an ENTP, folks a.k.a. another Tony Stark type, because Tony Stark is also an ENTP. Pretty dope. Let's see who's next on the typing list. Super Chats are closed, folks. Super Chats are closed. So don't put any more, please. Super Chats are definitely closed. Awesome. Let's look at who's next on the list. Um, Okay, why? Just because you're kind of mellow there and just like, what? I mean, why? who's to say that he's not high or stimulated, you know, and thus in ISFJ subconscious when he's doing that? He'd still be talking about outcomes. 
he may just be like very stoic, but why can't he be partially cognitive transitioned into ISFJ being stoic? You know, like why not? Well, simultaneously, it's like, okay, hey, I, am I gonna talk about outcomes? Because if you're control, you're gonna talk outcomes. He didn't talk outcomes at all. It was all process the entire time. It's all about process. Uh, it was not. It was not like you know. This is what I want, and I'm the, and this is how I'm going to get there, or this is what anyone would want me to do, and this is how I'm going to get there. That's more of an ISFJ focus, but he didn't do that. He's not an ISFJ, right? So how can he be control? Explain that to me. Just because you're slower doesn't always mean you're control. Sometimes you're just really mellow. You know, and that's what can happen. I mean, especially when you're uncomfortable, the SI inferior, you come off like an ISFJ because you're just uncomfortable. You got to break out of your shell. That's just how that works. So there's no other possibility at this point. Like, I'm sorry. All right. So we're moving Johnny Depp from the list. So $24.99 for Johnny Depp. Okay. So we have Dr. John P. A. Loanidis. And we have uh, um, Magnus Carlson and Andrew Yang. Uh, so uh, Andrew Yang is technically higher. So let's do Andrew Yang. Cool, a politician. Awesome. Let's do some. Uh, let's do some Andrew Yang. So Andrew Yang. Awesome. Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang interview. Andrew Yang on UBI and human centered capitalism. So, of all the ways you can serve, and we're serving through the Venture for America that you started, why did you pick this one? Running for president, running for a job that by most conventional um, measures you're not really ready for? Well, I spent seven years helping train hundreds of entrepreneurs and helping to create thousands of jobs around the country with uh, this nonprofit that I founded, Venture for America. With this uh, nonprofit that I founded, uh, Venture America, you know, because I am a TE user and I got to lead with my achievements because anytime I talk achievements, definitely doing some TE. You know what I'm saying? Definitely doing some TE. Got to do that. And all the while I'm saying it, I'm also gonna be really direct while I say it as well. But I'm a direct TE user, you know? So I'm like, okay, wow. ISTJ, INTJ, ESTJ, ENTJ, right off the bat for Andrew Yang. Let's keep going. And uh, I started that organization because I felt like our country was heading in the wrong direction in terms of its energies and the way our economy looked. And when Donald Trump got elected, I felt like our country was going in the wrong direction with all these other things, and I'm being very uh, TE, and then I'm mentioning other, people exper other people's experiences as, as well. And I'm gonna talk about the process, not necessarily the outcome, because I am movement-oriented. Wow, this guy is looking like ISTJ, uh, uh, INTJ already. In 2016, I took that as uh, a red flag that it was getting even worse faster than I thought. And when I dug into the numbers, I was shocked to see that we'd automated away millions of manufacturing jobs in the swing states that Trump won. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, that Trump won. And uh, I, I was, you know, uh, surprised to see that, you know. Uh, now, he's saying I a lot. And typically, I'd say that, okay, yeah, that's introverted sensing. The difference is, though, is that he's always tying it back to an experience somebody else is having, right? It's like the one-two punch. It's kind of like what uh, The Rock did when we were uh, psychoanalyzing The Rock uh, last year. You know, it's the same type of approach. Definitely extroverted sensing in this uh, way. And he's being very systematic about it as well. And tying it back to Trump with an additional extroverted thinking uh, comparison while being direct as well. Uh, and then now we're closing 30% of stores and malls and being a retail clerk is the most common job in the economy. My friends in California. Most common job in the economy. That's also extroverted thinking as well, uh, given a stat like that. When you're working on cars and trucks that can drive themselves and driving a truck is the most common job in 29 mm -hmm. states. So when you see this. This is also the most common job in 29 states. You can be driving a truck in that way. That's also extroverted sensing as well. And he's still being very movement about it. 
playing out and you see our country is confused about it. Our country is blaming immigrants for something that immigrants have next to nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. And then you game. Our country is blaming immigrants that have for this thing that have nothing to do with. Ugh, I'm going to have to put a point down for affiliative on that. Uh, interesting. We'll have to verify against introverted sensing just in case. But uh, this is getting a little interesting. Let's see how this goes. Out how you can uh, get meaningful solutions across the finish line in a reasonable time frame. Let's call it five to ten years. And I'd run a successful national nonprofit, and I saw what we can and can't. I've run a successful uh, national nonprofit, and I've and I've seen what we can or can't do. Again, that's extroverted sensing. Uh, gosh, uh, let's see here. Let's see how it goes. Do with that scale. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's that bleak? I do. The market is going to zero out more and more of us over time, uh, and we can pretend. I do think that's bleak. Oh, that's a very interesting statement. That's very uh, direct, but that was extremely responding. So definitely a uh, direct responding movement. You know, I'd have enough. Uh, I'd have enough to say uh, INTJ, but I really want to verify against ISTJ just in case. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. And uh, we might switch to interviews as well. Tend that it's still like, oh, it's only work hard and like, you know, play by the rules, everything is going to be fine. But well, one of the examples I use is, look, the robot truck doesn't care if you're a good conscience, you're going to be fine. Go but one of the examples I use is, look, you're out more and more of us over time. Uh, and we can pretend that it's still like, oh, it's only work hard and like, you know, play by the rules, everything is going to be fine. Ooh, we can pretend that it's like, oh, work hard and play by the rules. That's a pragmatic statement if I ever heard it because it's actually making fun of the, of the affiliated there. Is that some SE inferior ESFP subconscious mockery? I love that. It's going to be fine. Well, one of the examples I use is, look, the robot truck doesn't care if you're a good conscientious truck driver or a sloppy, terrible one. It's all the same. You know, the doesn't technology doesn't care if you're a really diligent radiologist uh, or like a not so diligent one. We can still just read the film better with software. So we have to try and uh, evolve as quickly as possible. There's a, a lot to be done. We have to try evolve as quickly as possible. There's a lot to be done. That's an abstract statement. That's also SE and I statement as well. And uh, fantastic, uh, still direct with that statement as well. Let's keep going. Now, when you think about what you see happening and the elimination of opportunity on a pretty... Let's actually sc scoop over to uh, this uh, interview over here. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So uh, I was supposed to be interviewed by a friend of mine, Kevin Roos, who had some travel issues. So I'm now interviewing myself. <laughs> so now I'm interviewing myself. That was a nice pragmatic statement and still not canceling everyone because the interview didn't take place. And so I decided to ask the question that's been on my mind, my wife's mind, for, for quite some time. Andrew, how do you come up with such innovative ideas? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm glad you asked. That is so expert in sensing, and it's so hilarious, too. Okay, I don't need to see any more. This guy is definitely an INTJ. So there you have it, folks. INTJ from Mr. Andrew uh, Yang. That's pretty cool. And running as a Democrat. He reminds me of my last boss that I had. Uh, but I'll, I'll say that uh, my boss is a little bit more on the conservative side than the uh, progressive side of things. While my boss was definitely a progressive human being, I would venture to say that he'd be more in line politically with a more conservative point of view instead of the uh, uh, the progressive point of view that I think Andrew Yang is putting forth, etc. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, you are most welcome, uh, General uh, Survival, uh, and thank you for your a super chat as well. Gosh, where is Andrew Yang? There is Andrew Yang. Awesome. Delete. Okay, Magnus Carlson, uh, which was put up first, so we'll do Magnus Carlson next. Magnus Carlson is next. Uh, thank you for your super chat as well, Magnus Carlson. Okay. I hope I spelled that right. Let me verify that. Did I spell that right? Yes, I did. At least according to the person that put it there. Okay. Magnus Carlson. Magnus Carlson uh, interview. I don't even know who Magnus Carlson is. Is that wrong? Magnus Carlson, latest interview. 
Okay. Norwegian chess grandmaster, world chess champion. Okay, that's cool. Mr. Magnus Carlsen to join me here on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the real star. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you for coming. I just watched you beat 24 persons in chess. And I can tell you I know very little about chess, but I know something about the brain. So I apologize on beforehand if I ask stupid questions regarding chess. But I'll start out with one question. I know many... As you see him scanning the room in that way, looking for exits, you know, maybe a little any nemesis there. Is this guy an INTJ? A little interesting. Many people have. What are you thinking when you are playing all those 24 persons? I mean, uh, it varies uh, at any, any time. Uh, most of the time, frankly speaking, I'm annoyed at some mistake I made in, uh, in uh, another, another game and trying not to, to, to focus about, about that. Uh, Ooh, wow. I'm really annoyed about a mistake that I made. Talk about performance. When people talk about performance in that regard. It's definitely extroverted uh, sensing, uh, introverted intuition, try not to focus about that. He's also obviously responding as well. He's very responding. So let's keep going. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's not easy because uh, there are players of, of very different strengths. So yes. you cannot really uh, distribute your um, energy um, evenly because that would be, a, you know, a, a bit too much. So you have to, to sort of think who, who do you need to spend more energy on and, and to, yeah, to keep that. But how early on can you detect? Think about uh, direct deriving uh, different, uh, yeah, I do maintain INTPs are best at chess, but there's some INTJs who are amazing at it too. Those players who need your attention and those who are not, as, not, not that good to chess. I think um, you, can, you can often see it pretty early on from some opening moves also uh, in the way people move. I think you can see it very early on with the uh, uh, opening moves. That's SE and I as well. So let's see. Move their pieces if they're attentive to the game or, or looking at... If those people are attentive to the game. Expert sensing is aware of other people's attention spans. He's also talking about his system that he follows. So he's systematic as well. That's something else. There, there are uh, a lot of signs. How do you move your piece? There are a lot of signs. That's also an extroverted sensing statement as well. Uh, seems to be direct. I haven't really seen him much informed or leave anything unsaid. When you are not that good. <laughs> uh, well, a steady hand is always uh, a good thing. Making up your mind about where the piece is going to go before you grab it is, is a sure sign that you know what you're doing. Um, that's a sure sign that you know what you're doing. Um, can I have to say that's an expert thinking process in there? Uh, and uh, this guy is like really, I don't know, kind of insecure with uh, being on camera and whatnot and the experiences that he's giving other people. Let's say direct, he's looking a little more and more like an INTJ. But it, it's, it's, it's hard to really explain completely. It's just that as an experienced chess player, that's something you, you see. You just you have an intuitive feeling, you can, you, you can feel it in yourself. Yes, uh, and that is why I find this uh, whole premise very, very uh, difficult, because mo in most aspects of my chess life, that will simply be the answer. I know, and I don't know why I know, or I think, uh, but I don't know why I think that, because at some point it all becomes very, very intuitive. Yes, but I can say to you that most of life is like this. At some point, it all becomes very intuitive. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll put you down for abstract. The guy's an obvious NT. We're going to be testing against INTP, INTJ, just in case, but uh, let's keep going. Many things I do in my life is intuitive, but is based on a very, very skilled analysis of my brain. When I behave socially, there's a lot of analysis going on, but I behave intuitively. I don't think about what I'm doing, but I'm doing the right thing. And if I'm not doing the right thing, people will, make, will see it very, very instantly. And I think in many ways it's the same with chess. 
that you have this pattern recognition, you have a lot of analysis going on, and you are presented to the result, but you don't really know how you reached the result. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's exactly um, that that's ex exactly what it is. You you obviously you you've anal you analyze, but it's based on patterns that you've studied over the course of uh, of your life. But do you remember the first time you played chess? Uh, I don't remember the first time I played chess. Uh, I I the thing. I don't remember the first time I played chess. I. Like, he keeps talking as extroverted sensing. I'm just not seeing introverted sensing here, guys. I'm just not. I'm just not seeing it at all. I want to say he's an INTP, but I, I'm not seeing it. The thing is, I wouldn't really call it playing chess, because I was just moving pieces around, <laughs> I think, pretty randomly. And the thing is, it's very hard to remember. I think pretty randomly. That's an SI statement. That's an SI statement. This guy's a little bit harder. Let's let's stay in the game. Remember sequences of moves that don't really make any sense, uh, and it's also not like I caught the bug immediately, because uh, uh, the first couple of years after I learned the rules, I found it very very hard, um, and I I sort of. After I learned the rules, after a couple of years, I learned that very hard. All right, now a little introverted sensing is coming out. Start talking about his experience a lot. This is getting interesting. Remember the time when it turned around and I got really interested in, in chess, and I still remember a lot. Remember the time it turned around and I was really interested in chess? Okay, there you go. Some introverted sensing. Out of the thoughts that I had about particular games back then, but before that it's, it's uh, very, very scattered. So before you began to see the pattern, you don't remember what was going on. Can you tell me what, what was it that turned you on to chess? What happened? Um, so the simple explanation is that I wanted to beat my older sister, because um, I wanted to beat her at everything. Uh, I wanted to beat my older sister because I wanted to beat her at everything. Outperform her. S E N I T E F I. There you go. You know, still very direct, not informative. Uh, um, and uh, my my father was was studying with with her because he had pretty much given up uh, me. In chess. In chess. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it was fair. She was older. She was more uh, mature. So it made sense that he would he would uh, try with her, even though he thought that I might have a talent for for. Even though he thought I might have a talent, that's also T E F I S E N I. I don't know. It just really, really seems like S F P N T J Quadra. I'm trying to prove I N T P here, guys. I'm trying for chess earlier on. And so I wanted to, to be here, and eventually I started following the lessons, started making my own suggestions, and I started studying uh, a bit on my own. Uh, so I would look at games from, uh, from books and magazines that we, we had in the, in the house. He's talking about his process, he's also talking about system, he's very process oriented, it's very movement. He's not really talking about outcomes. Uh, continue to study from there. Um, but gosh, it's so hard. He's really balanced. Because my father uh, is an avid chess player. And I would constantly ask my father questions about this and that. But mostly I would just study on, on my own and be very curious just to explore new possibilities. Yeah, very curious to explore new possibilities because I'm abstract. Talking about his uh, father a little bit more, studying his father. It's also expert in sensing. And and then when did you... I want a different interview. I really want a different interview entirely. Let's do this one. Yes. Magnus was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Gary Kasparov writes that if Carlson can rekindle the world's fascination with the royal game, we will soon be living in the Carlson era. I am pleased to have Magnus Carlson at this table. Welcome. 
Thank you. It's good to have you here. We just somebody brought this in. Uh, um, I really, really wish I knew. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I will uh, in, you know, uh, 20, 30 years uh, when I'm older and, and wiser. Um, right maybe I will know in 20 or 30 years when I'm older and wiser. I could argue an eye critic there, um, but uh, that's technically an eye statement. I could argue an eye critic, but we'll see. Right now, I, I know that... Um, you know, I, I've spent a lot of yeah, time on chess, right. obviously, and I've developed a feeling for the game. Uh, I calculate well and so on. But there are also many others who put in the same same hours, have have the same dedication. So uh, it's it's hard to say. Uh, but uh, w what I do know is that the game somehow comes naturally, na naturally to, to me. You. Yeah. When did you discover that? Um, I think. Uh, uh, pretty early on, um, I um, you know I, I was spending a lot of of time on on chess and uh, and somehow I, I kept uh, improving. Uh, at spending a lot of time on chess, I kept on improving. That's movement, guys. It's movement. The high rate, while um, the other. Um, you know, players that at my age that I was competing against. You were beating all of them and moving ahead. Yes, exactly. And then... I was uh, beating all of them, moving ahead. Yes, exactly. And talking about his achievements there. Uh, and, it, you know, it was always uh, fun and, and uh, while not effortless, nevertheless, you know, uh, things were going well. Yeah. What is it about chess you love? Carl Karch brings up a good point in terms of not seeing any extroverted feeling. That's exactly my thing. I haven't really seen any extroverted feeling at all. Nothing really self-deprecating. This is like somebody who has, you know, been able to get to a point where they have like humility and an insane amount of humility, this guy. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with that. It just seems like he has, uh, you know, a high level of opinion. Um, so... And, and, and yes, uh, Salim Aswad, uh, yes, mostly TE users speak about achievements. TI users don't really speak about their own achievements that often because of expert feeling causing them to be self-deprecating, which is very typical and normal of expert feelers. Uh, so he's, he's just not doing that here. Um, it's hard to say. <laughs> um... I, I I do know that uh, once once I got into chess, I, I was really fascinated by the game, and I spent, uh, you know, uh, a lot of time on it simply because that's what I love to do. Uh, I, I don't know what it was about it. Yeah. I, I I really don't. I don't know what it was about. I didn't have any outcome in mind because I was movement AF. I'm not control, and I'm direct and responding. So yeah, guys. He is an INTJ. I really tried to see if I could prove INTP with him. I'm just not seeing it. Just not seeing it. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think so. I really don't think that I'm wrong about INTJ on this one. I'm really not. Maybe I'll do like a full-on lecture about Magnus Carlsen, but not seeing it, guys. Definitely going to have to go with this one. So, so yeah. And uh, let's see, let's do the next one. I got time for one more and then we're gonna call it quits uh, for the night, folks. Uh, and uh, remember next week, uh, I'll pick from one of the uh, super chats uh, to start the show off uh, that, uh, but the highest from the last week and we'll start to show off next week until the new super chats come in. Uh, and we'll get that going uh, from there as well. So let's see who is next on the list. So Magnus Carlsen, we'll delete that as well. And then we have, uh, we have, okay, Dr. John uh, P.A. Lowenitis. Uh, okay, don't know who that is. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Lan Lowandish uh, interview. Okay, cool. Awesome. Dr. John Lowenidis on research inefficiencies. I'm liking where this is going. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, please, please tell me more about these things, sir. Please, 
efficiency of, um, of some of the research practices that we have adopted. Um, there is inefficiency in the planning of research because sometimes we ignore that some other research has already happened that we would need to take into account. And we have 20 million scientists publishing scientific work. It's very difficult for any of us to be able to be up to date with everything that is happening. There is uh, inefficiency in the design of studies. Um, we have made... There is inefficiency in design of studies. Anyone who's talking efficiency, that's pretty cool. Seems like he's a finisher, you know what I'm saying? And uh, definitely, uh, hard to tell if he's direct, but uh, definitely saying like these people are failing or the, our performance is down as scientists, etc. So I'm going to have to put a point down for expert sensing. And he seems very achievement focused, which is TEFI, and he's definitely systematic. He might be an INTJ, but who knows. Made lots of progress in statistical methods and uh, in, in methodology of, of how to design studies for different types of questions. And uh, even the best trained scientists sometimes cannot catch up with all the, the new options that might be available. Uh, there is inefficiency in the analysis of the results. Um, increasingly, we will verify against ISTJ. Don't worry. If I can hit the play button. Ever. Listen, I didn't call my uh, contact at NIH to ask what was the term for this month's submissions, but I need to check on that. Huge um, databases. And, and uh, physicians. That, uh, much you know, of the all of us were wonderful Snapchat, marketing so tools. These for huge uh, opportunities that are offered to us, but uh, may not be fully representative of um, uh, what the universe of information would look like. There's inefficiencies in the publishing system. Oh, that was actually an affiliative statement. That definitely was an affiliative statement. Okay, that's cool. Talking about like these, these uh, organizations doing the right thing. Uh, which means that um, uh, there's lots of research that despite peer review um, fails in a number of uh, uh, options uh, of uh, transparency, completeness, uh, reliability. Options, uh, transparency, uh, completeness, talk about people taking away the choice of others. That's S I N E, and that's also affiliative as well. Ability, accuracy. Uh, there's uh, inefficiencies in dissemination. What is the message that eventually gets interpreted or um, let alone the. What he's saying there is here, he's going down a list in his head that's a T E F I, that's also concrete. This guy sounds like an S J at this point wider public hears about a research paper or, or a specific investigation. And there's inefficiencies also in application. The public hears about this as well uh, in terms of application. And that's that's a concrete statement where he talks about application as T-E-F-I. It seems like he's talking about stolen opportunities as well because he's researching in inefficiencies. That's S-I-N-E. Of research findings. Um, since we have uh, about three or four million papers published every year, uh, if we just... Uh, have only some of them uh, unsystematically influencing uh, what eventually will get translated into applications, we could have a distorted picture. Um, so there's many levels, and this is just a, a few, that there's potential for improvement down the road if we focus. There is potential for improvement down the road. Okay, that's uh, S, I, and E as well, expert intuition in that regard. Uh, let's keep going. Focus on finding ways that we can optimize the, the process for each one of these steps. Okay. Precision medicine, personalized medicine, individualized medicine, stratified medicine, subgroup medicine. I didn't call my uh, contact at NIH to ask what was the term for this month's submissions, but I need to check on that. My name is Yvette Briggis, and I work in our people operations team, and I'm really excited to introduce Dr. John Ioannidis. Uh, John is a professor of medicine. Major discoveries. Maybe a few thousand. I, I, I see two. <laughs> okay, I'm an optimist. I think we have several thousand, but, but really not 15 million uh, discoveries. So far less than one per person on average, probably one in a thousand or one in 10,000 or maybe one in a million, depending on how you look at that. Expert thinking statistics as well. And uh, definitely seems direct. Uh, and
and uh, movement oriented. Self-correction should work. So uh, even though we don't make big discoveries all the time, uh, we find small pieces that may be correct or wrong, and we can correct them if they're wrong. Um, the ability of self-correction is considered one of the main features of science in a cumulative meta-analysis framework. If sufficient time elapses, then we will get to the truth eventually. But the question is, how quickly do we get there? So, uh, of course, we corrected that the Earth uh, uh, is not the center of the world and the sun is not going around uh, the Earth. But it took us about 2,000 years to do that. So uh, an issue of efficiency arises on how we could do that faster. Uh, uh, Self-correction is often not happening promptly enough. And it may be impeded uh, psychological science. This includes a lot of disciplines. And uh, it's summing some empirical studies that were published last year, well, late 2012, a year and a half ago, in Perspectives on Psychological Science. I was asked to summarize all these empirical studies uh, on one paper. I was asked to summarize uh, these studies in one paper. And he's constantly talking about the affiliative point of view. Hey. We need to do the right thing based on our research, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's super, uh, you know, it's super important. Um, so, yeah, uh, definitely looking like he is STJ NFP Quadra. He's definitely direct, definitely movement oriented. He's going speed racer. In that same issue. Talking about the system that he's following, but he's not really necessarily talking about outcomes. He's just more like, hey, this is what's happening. And here's how it looks like. The, the optimal represents less than 1% of that literature. The self-correcting, again, less than 1%. False non-replication, far less than 1%. Perpetuated fallacy. It's kind of interesting because he's kind of almost being... Not in this, I'm not calling him a hypocrite, but like he's pointing out hypocrisy. You have ISTJ types, which it looks like this guy is an ISTJ, constantly talking all the time about how everybody else has this attitude of, you know, oh, you don't, I can't believe what you're saying because you might not know what you're talking about. You better cite your source. But then he's talking about how can we cite our sources? I need to be able to cite my source. Everyone needs to be able to cite our source, but we're not actually correcting and being able to be efficiently. Even Jab, my former co-host on the show, stated that it's very difficult as a scientist because he's a chemist, and I mentioned this before, that you can't necessarily reproduce other scientists' experiments. It's extremely difficult and very inefficient, and he's absolutely correct. But then you have this gentleman here who's pointing this out, yet he consistently is relying on the citation of sources on a regular basis of, uh, in terms of and sources that are considered to be empirical evidence. So then that in reality, that could actually mean scientific thought is actually more open and weak to PR or public opinion or popular opinion in terms of what people are accepting is true, and not necessarily what is actually true, based on what the real empirical evidence is, specifically because of how inefficient it is to reproduce experiments for the sake of the scientific method. This is a consistent issue. You see what I'm saying? And that's where this guy is coming from, right? So, uh, and, and, and yes, uh, Cabron in uh, the chat put up a very good point. Publish or perish too. It is a business. And people, you guys got to understand that, you know, people in science are not benevolent. Everyone's trying to make money too. Look at the interest. I get that I'm triple systematic as an ENTP, but look at the interest. What are people's interests? This is something that uh, John Nash has been trying to point out to everybody from a game theory standpoint. And yes, I'm going to be doing lectures on game theory in the very near future, but this is all sort of very necessary, you know? Let's keep going. I'll see 2%. Unconfirmed gen uh, Christina and Young Sundquist at the University of Lund do have access to these databases. So what we did here, we just did an analysis. We are trying to associate all medications against all cancer. There's about 2,000 different types of medications. We group them into 550-something um, clusters because there's several beta blockers, for example. We believe that this is sensible, that three out of four medications Ooh, I believe that this is sensible. Wow, that's a very SI statement, and it's also TEFI. Uh, there's no reason to go any further. This man is an ISTJ, for sure. Definitely an ISTJ. A little bit hard to detect on the introverted sensing versus extroverted sensing side, 
but definitely an ISTJ based on every all the other evidence that we have. Uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty excellent uh, to see that because this guy is very well rounded uh, within his other sides, pointing out inefficiencies with ESTP shadow, and then trying to get the word out with his ENF piece of conscious. This man is pretty well developed. So, all right. So uh, that's going to be concluding today's show uh, on uh, this. Uh, but I would like to mention, uh, folks, uh, we do offer uh, free coaching. If you guys do transcripts, go to the uh, contact us drop down on csjoseph.life uh, and uh, put in a request to receive a transcript. You guys can earn coupon codes for coaching. I think it's like $100 off per package done. So we really need more transcripts, guys, to get all of the videos transcribed and on the blog for anyone to uh, read. It really helps. Uh, we might even have them translated into other languages as soon as all of them have been transcribed into English. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, talk to anyone who can offer uh, you know, language trans translation on everything that we got. Uh, also, if you guys want to add in some Facebook reviews or some testimonials as well, uh, hit us on our, uh, like us on our Facebook page. Please add reviews. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, as well as any testimonials about how this has changed your life, uh, please do that at csjoseph.life uh, and then go to the contact us drop down to testimonial submission. We'd really appreciate that. Um, something else I was supposed to like talk about, but I don't even remember. Anyway, folks, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, I hope to get another episode of Season 19 out right away and uh, got plenty of additional content coming down uh, down the, uh, the, the pipe as well. I just looked at my content delivery plan and this huge spreadsheet on top of all the lecture requests because I like kept track of every lecture request that comes in through like YouTube comments. And it is absolutely insane. Like seriously, it is insane. I, I think we're knocking on maybe potentially upwards of 2,000 possible videos to do, uh, which is crazy. And uh, I also hired a consultant recently to help us optimize our SEO and make changes around here uh, because there's just a lot of things that are being done inefficiently and we're trying to get that figured out. Also, I will be doing a lecture on verifying Shane Dawson. People have been asking me for that, that's coming. Uh, doing one on Drake as well. Doing one on Ethan Klein as well. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions in terms of which people, which famous people you would like to have verified, go to csjoseph.life, go to contact us, and throw in like a like a, a support ticket. You can email support at csjoseph.life. It'll create a ticket. If you would like to see a lecture about like you know verifying somebody's type, uh, I'd love to get those lecture requests. I'm actually going to be creating a new playlist just for verifying people that we've typed on these live streams just to go in a little bit deeper. And uh, we're going to keep going from there. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can make something great. Um, but yeah, definitely doing some, uh, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> some verifications for people who disagree with me, but that's fine. I mean, I know that I mistyped Drake. He's actually an ESTP and I'm gonna actually walk us through like why that's the case. And it's basically going to be like the how to not mistype series. And we're gonna be looking at mistakes that were made versus you know how to do it right. And it's more of a, a an, an inward look in terms of like the how to process by using the type grid. Also, one final bit of news right here, I would like to say, as people are obviously leaving right now, the uh, we're going to have a test probably deployed on the website very soon. Uh, it's not going to be the end all be all test, the final version of the test or all the best versions of the test are going to be deployed on our web app as well as our uh, mobile app that's coming out very soon. But until then, we're going to have a basic test, which does work and you can, and it is, it's very accurate. And I would say, if you actually understand how to take this test, uh, you will get a 100% result. The test itself is not broken. It's just the person using the test. Luckily, the test will educate the user on how to use the test before they actually answer the questions. Uh, and then they answer the questions and they get the result. That is coming very soon. I might be able to have it pulled off this week. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping I have it off this week, but it is coming. Uh, so we'll see how that is. And by the way, 
if you guys want me to, like I said, if you guys want to see people redone and uh, reconfirmed and verified, you got to make a submittal. Email support at csjoseph.life or email csjoseph at csjoseph.life. Throw, e throw in your emails, get that done, and uh, we'll get it to you. So a lot of exciting stuff coming out for us. It's just been really busy. I had some, my, I had some serious health issues, uh, but uh, my friends and my wife were able to help me out uh, with that, which I appreciate and uh, definitely going in that direction. So yeah, that's it for me, folks. Thank you all for watching and uh, thank you all for the super chats. I really appreciate it. We uh, And uh, thank you all for the support in the channel. Uh, like I said, next time we do this, uh, I'll just go off the next highest super chat until additional new ones come in as well. Otherwise, thank you very much, folks, and thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.